Good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock and time to start today's briefing. Joining us on the briefing today, we have Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett, Milwaukee County Executive David Crowley, Dr. Ben Weston, Associate Professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Director of Medical Services for the Office of Emergency Management, Darren Rausch, Health Officer and Director of the Greenfield Health Department, and Dr. Mary Beth Graham, Associate Chief and Professor of the Medical College of Wisconsin, joins us to talk about the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine. Mayor Barrett, you're starting us off today. Well, thank you very much, Sydney. And we all recognize that the last 24 hours have been historic and disgusting in most regards. When you look at what happened yesterday in Washington, DC, um, an insurrection that is led by the President of the United States um, is something that as Americans, we all should be deploring. And I'm pleased to hear people are talking out. I'm also concerned, I think as many are, of the security at the Capitol. The, see the United States Capitol so easily breached um, is a matter of grave concern, uh, not just domestically, but I'm sure that there are other nations around the country, I mean, around the world that are not friendly to the United States who look at that and are asking themselves um, just how easy it is to, to breach the United States Capitol. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Again, for those members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate that stood up to this insurrection, I thank them to to the, those officers that tried to maintain the peace, I thank them. Um, a lot of people stepped forward, but again, you had a situation that was essentially um, unprecedented in our American history. Um, and it's a day that hopefully we'll never see again, never see anything like that again, um, particularly at a time when we are trying to deal with a very, very serious pandemic here locally and throughout the country. And so that's where our focus should be, not on creating an insurrection and trying to delay the peaceful transfer of power in our democracy, which is again, clearly what we saw happen yesterday. But here locally, we continue to do the very, very important work, both in terms of testing, um, we're beginning to ramp up our vaccination, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, but the testing component remains a very, very vital component of what we're trying to do. And I wanna thank um, all of our employees at the health department and all those that are working with them um, to continue this work as the weather gets colder, although we've been pretty lucky here in January so far, um, this gets to be more challenging. But we've got a lot of people who are really stepping forward to do this work. And just yesterday at what we now call the new American family field, we had 916 people who were tested on the Northwest side. We had 423 people tested on the South side. We had 204 people. And in the South Milwaukee zone, we had 247. Um, so. Again, we had well over 1,600 people who were tested yesterday. We'd like to see those numbers even higher. Dr. Weston, I'm sure, will be discussing the positivity rate, which is a concern as we see that creep a little bit higher, um, because that is the number that is really relevant when we are trying to determine how good a job we're doing in controlling the spread of this disease. But our key indicators for this week are red for cases and testing. They're yellow for care and PPE and tracing. So uh, we clearly want to make more progress in the area of cases and testing. Um, but most recently, our cases indicator was green, which tells us that we are trending poorly. Um, we, are in, we were anticipating an increase in positive cases following the holiday season. And unfortunately, the data is showing this to be true. Uh, we're now at an average of 11% positive. Uh, and I know that wintertime makes physical distancing more difficult. Um, we spend a lot more of our time indoors which we know increases the risk of spreading the virus. But we have the power to continue to drive down our percent positive rate and keep our families and loved ones safe. So the solution remains the same as it has been for the last almost 10 months now, and that's to watch your distance, to wash your hands and to wear a mask. So we ask people to please continue to do this. Um, I'm very, very pleased that yesterday we were able to get uh, an allocation of 100 doses of the Pfizer vaccination here in the city of Milwaukee. Um, I spoke to the health commissioner. Uh, well more than half of those have already been distributed this today, this starting this morning. So that is moving very, very smoothly. There have been no negative reactions at this point. Um, and this is going to the frontline workers that we have who fall into the 1A category. So it is going to be the people at our three healthcare clinics. Um, it is going to be people who are at American Family Field, both those who are doing the actual testing and the volunteers who are assisting them. Um, and it's gonna be 50 of our firefighters. But again, I'm very, very pleased. And what this is all doing is it is setting up for a much more expansive increase that we'll have as we get the no next dosage of, of Pfizer vaccinations. 
um, which we know will be 800, at least 800 for next week. Um, and we'll get the first allocation of those on Monday. Um, we're pleased that we're able to work out this great arrangement with the state of Wisconsin. And they have been just wonderful to work with. Um, as you all know, the visor vaccination is the one that requires the deep freeze. Um, and if you don't have the deep freeze, it has to be used within 120 hours. Um, but we have structured the allocation of that and the distribution of that so that we don't run up against that 120 hour limit. And we have enough people in our 1A category that we're gonna continue to work on that. We're eager, of course, I think, as is everyone, um, to get through this 1A category and then to get to 1B, which includes essential workers, includes teachers, includes our police officers, through the 1A before we move to that. So every indication is that we can ramp up and be prepared when we go to the broadest distribution of the vaccine. And that's what our goal is, is to build this distribution network um, as quickly as we can. Um, I also recognize that there are a lot of questions. Uh, there are still many, many unknowns about the vaccine. There's unknowns that we have about distribution and this is all happening in real time. But people have lots of questions and we would like to do our best to answer them. So as we've done in the past, if you have questions you would like us to answer at our future press briefings, please leave questions or comments on my social media channels. Um, That I'm going to turn over to the county executive and, and thank him for the great work that he's doing and, and that the county is doing in this partnership that we have together. County executive. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mayor Barrett. And, you know, it's kind of hard to start today without acknowledging what many of us, if not all of us, uh, witnessed at our nation's capital, uh, which was an insurrection. And, and like I said in my, my press release, it was a sad, dark day for our country when we have more than 100 House members, a dozen senators, and the President of the United States incite domestic terrorism and attempt to delay or disrupt the peaceful transfer of power of the presidency. Yesterday's events were extremely humiliating and it was a humiliating day for this whole country, an attack on our American democracy, and it was a distraction from the real work that needs to be done on behalf of the American people. And I would like to thank the many people who dedicated their lives to serving the public and working tirelessly to ensure a healthy, safe, and prosperous year ahead. This work is difficult, it's time consuming, and sometimes burdensome. And, and our public servants do this willingly and selflessly uh, for the benefit of our community. So we need to remember that. And so today I wanna encourage us to follow uh, their example and stay focused on caring for our community between ensuring peaceful transfer of, of power, uh, vaccinating the American people against COVID-19 and helping residents navigate the many negative impacts of this pandemic. Uh, there's real important work that needs to be done. And I wanna welcome our guest today, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Graham from the Medical College of Wisconsin. She specializes in infection disease and is joining to discuss the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. And we, we continue to turn to experts like Dr. Graham, Dr. Weston and our healthcare professionals and the 11 public health officers representing the municipalities uh, throughout Milwaukee County as trusted sources of information. So let's keep our focus on the path forward and continue to make healthy choices for the benefit of ourselves in our community. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you for all. And I know we witnessed a lot of stuff last night and uh, hand it over to Dr. Weston. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. Uh, first to our numbers, we have had 87,442 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our community and 903 individuals who've died in Milwaukee County. We have recognized and we've saluted our first responders many times during this pandemic for their courage, their selflessness and their perseverance in showing up day in and day out to care for and protect those most in need. Uh, yesterday's terrible, uh, reprehensible events in the Capitol remind us that regardless of COVID, our law enforcement, our fire, and our EMS personnel are called on often, uh, sometimes without even moments notice to respond to unpredictable, uncontrolled and dangerous situations. We're appreciative of the work that they did yesterday uh, and the work that those in our community do every day. And on that note, I'm encouraged to report that yesterday the Milwaukee County Office of Emergency Management vaccinated an additional 80 EMS providers. And we continue to work with the health systems and our local health departments to vaccinate every one of our EMS providers as fast as possible 
uh, as we work so hard to protect those who work to protect us. As far as our trends, we continue to see increases in our percent positivity, uh, as well as low levels of testing. This is a dangerous combination and a warning sign of what could come. These two trends have led to our key indicators turning red for both cases as well as for testing. And these are early warnings that should prompt individuals to seek out testing when needed and to continue to take personal precautions of masking and physical distancing. Today, I wanna to take a few minutes to address some questions that I've received from members of our community focused around testing as well as vaccination. Uh, first, a question I received from a woman in uh, Cudahy. She asked, now that we have a vaccine, can we start to cut back on testing? And this is such an important question. And, and the reason why is because testing is still so important to our controlling COVID. There's two main reasons why we test, which remained as important as ever. The first is to inform individuals of disease status to allow them to prevent spreading the virus and to connect them with healthcare should they get worse. And the second reason is to inform the COVID response in our community, to better understand the disease burden and guide resource allocation. We want to try to focus resources as much as possible on communities that have higher rates of disease, with a particular eye on those that also have lower rates of testing. There will certainly be a time when we can begin to ramp down our testing infrastructure uh, and when COVID testing will take its place alongside influenza testing, largely confined to the healthcare environment. But we're certainly not there yet. And, and frankly, we likely will not be there for many months. In the meantime, it's as important as ever for those with symptoms of COVID, which can be as mild as cold-like symptoms for those with close contact with someone who's had COVID or those referred to get tested. Second, from a man in Milwaukee, uh, the question was, should we be worried about the new strains of COVID, uh, COVID being found in parts of the world? So this is referring to the new strains of the virus that have been found in the UK, uh, as well as South Africa, and now showing up in parts of the United States. They seem uh, to, what seems to have happened is there's a series of mutations uh, that appear to make the virus more transmissible, more contagious. And the reason for this increased contagiousness seems to be either a change in the spike protein, uh, this is what the virus uses to bind to cells in our body, or a change to the viral load in our upper airways, our mouth, our noses, uh, that can lead to increased transmission. And certainly increased transmissibility of the virus is problematic as it makes it harder to contain and to fight the pandemic. It's important, however, to note that this does not change the way that we should protect ourselves. Masking and physical distancing remain the way to protect yourself and protect others from getting infected. Regarding the vaccine, it's not fully known that the vaccine will protect from these strains, but early signs indicate that it likely would. And in the worst case, the vaccine could be rapidly modified now that it's been developed to protect from this over a series of a few months, but, but hopefully it'll provide protection anyhow. We'll know more uh, on that front in the near future. And finally, a question that, that comes from all over the county uh, and well beyond the county, uh, which is when can I get the vaccine? How will I know when my time to get it has come? So right now there's a very specific group who can get the vaccine uh, in that phase 1A. So this is healthcare providers, uh, EMS providers, and those in long-term care facilities, staff, and residents. The state has started their distribution starting with healthcare systems and those affiliated with healthcare systems and it'll soon expand out from there. After 1A comes 1B. This is essential workers and those who are 75 years and older. Uh, and then 1C, those with certain health conditions and 65 and older. Uh, and then expanding out to the general public. As for timing, it's difficult to predict. It's no secret that the vaccine rollout at the national level has been slower than anticipated. One would hope that we begin 1B sometime in February, 1C perhaps in March or April, uh, and expanding to everybody by late spring. That said, uh, we certainly will keep the community well aware of where we are in the process and how to obtain vaccine when your time comes. Uh, and as the mayor mentioned, please uh, submit more questions on the Facebook page. We'll work to answer them uh, as well in the future. I'm very pleased to have uh, Dr. Graham join us in a few minutes. She's gonna talk about safety of vaccines, uh, something on, on many people's minds and a, a very important question. 
thank you very much. Uh, stay safe. And for now, I'll hand it to Director Rausch. Thank you very much, Dr. Weston. It's my pleasure to join you all today for today's media briefing. My name is Darren Rausch with the Greenfield Health Department. Um, before we start today to talk about the data, I just wanted to hit a couple overarching themes, one about the data and then one about vaccination, just to kind of dovetail with what Dr. Weston just mentioned. Um, first about the data, we are seeing what looks like a slight increase in COVID-19 cases countywide over the past week. We know that the data has trended up most recently in the last week, um, both in the whole county population, as well as with our children 18 and under when we look at that data. And just to flag for everyone as well, any potential increase in COVID-19 cases following both the Christmas and New Year's holiday weekends would start to be seen this week and over the next couple weeks. Shifting a little bit to vaccination, <clears throat> As Dr. Weston mentioned, vaccination efforts are underway and more vaccine is entering the Milwaukee area every week and we anticipate more and more to come. Wisconsin is in currently in vaccination phase 1A and we know vaccine is targeted for healthcare and personnel and frontline workers in healthcare settings. I was just listening to the statewide media briefing uh, moments ago and one of the comments that Julie Willems Van Dyke from the secretary's office mentioned is that the amount of vaccine allocated to Wisconsin is still very small. We're only getting about 70,000 doses allocated to Wisconsin on a weekly basis. Therefore, the volume of vaccine coming in remains quite small. We are hoping that in recent, in coming weeks that that number will increase and that vaccination can expand and that we can rapidly get through phase 1A and move to phase 1B. Dovetailing on what Dr. Weston said, we will make sure as we prepare to move into phase 1B that we will notify the public through media, social media, websites, and other communication modes to indicate to people that we are moving into the next phase and make them aware of the next phase in which they might be able to be vaccinated or maybe their loved ones and family members. At the federal level, we know that phase 1B is, is looking at priorities of essential personnel, school staff, and adults over the age of 75. And there's a group within the state of Wisconsin looking at those priorities right now. I assure you, everybody who wants a vaccine will get one as our supplies increase and as we move through that phased prioritization. And I understand that being patient in the middle of a global pandemic is difficult, but for those waiting your turn, I encourage everyone to spend some time on the CDC website, look on the state of Wisconsin Department of Health Services website and read about the vaccine so that you can make an informed decision when it's your turn for vaccination. So with that, I'm gonna jump into the data real quick and we'll walk through some of the highlights for this week. Uh, starting here, looking at daily number of new cases, I mentioned that we're seeing this increase over the last several days, really starting at about the Christmas holiday and moving forward. Again, we know there's some data pending, but we're seeing a little blip. It's hard to know if that's going to be a sustained increase, if that's something due to the holidays, or if this increase is more indicative of the fact that the numbers were so low around the Christmas holidays that they did have to bump up. We know that historically we've seen small inflections in the data um, from time to time. And I'm guessing next week we'll have a much clearer picture on what that looks like. Looking at deaths um, in the Milwaukee area, we know we had a huge spike in deaths in November and December. I'm happy to report that right now, currently, we are at a very low number of deaths, maybe one or two per day in Milwaukee County, but I'll continue to reflect for everyone that deaths are a lagging indicator, and oftentimes these are getting reported two to three weeks later um, due to the nature of death reporting and how that data gets into our system. We have talked about the reproductive number or the transmission rate for many, many months now, and what's alarming to me, and again, this data is left shifted a little bit because this is a seven day transmission number. And what I'm very, un <clears throat> very sad to report today is that we are seeing a number 
of 1.14 for the entire county that occurred about December 24th. So that would indicate that we are at risk for increasing transmission. When we look at the data a little bit more granularly and we look at the city of Milwaukee on the top and the suburban communities on the bottom, we are seeing at this point with this data a higher transmission rate in the city of Milwaukee than we are in the suburban communities, but they are very, very close, only about a hundredth of a decimal point apart. So again, we need to continue to work and push that transmission rate number below one to suppress disease. The demographic patterns, as we've talked about in previous weeks, looking at income and age, race and ethnicity and gender, still largely hold true that, as we have over the last several months. We continue to see a lot of cases in the white population, although the biggest rate of cases is in our minority populations. And we're seeing the rate of COVID-19 in our Asian American population increasing quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. We are seeing cases occurring largely in our younger populations, our 25 to 60 year olds, although the rate of disease is highest and the rates of hospitalization and deaths are highest in our old po older populations. So again, these are very important trends that we continue to watch. We continue to highlight these for you so that we can make informed decisions about risk in our communities, in our families. I want to talk about testing coverage next. We know that early in November, we were testing at a very high clip, about 45,000 a week in the Milwaukee County area. That had dipped to about 35,000 throughout late December and the month of December. And now we're, we're even going lower than that. And I want to point out that there's a lot of testing. And as Dr. Weston mentioned, testing is still a very important strategy in controlling COVID-19. When we look at our trends, as been highlighted before on this briefing, the trend is increasing countywide, albeit small, that trend in percent positivity is moving up. And lastly, we'll talk about where cases are occurring. This particular graphic is looking at all of the cases throughout the pandemic. So we're, approach, we're entering our 11th month of the pandemic very, very soon. And we see cases across the county in our most recent two weeks, the red and orange areas are very indicative of high rates of COVID-19 disease. And we're seeing many pockets across the county where disease is occurring at a very high clip. So that is the end of the data report today. I would love to um, now pass it on to Dr. Mary Beth Graham from the Medical College of Wisconsin and to hear from her about the vaccine. Dr. Graham. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just give a little bit of a shout out at the beginning. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about what happened in DC over the last 24 hours, um, but I'd like to comment on what's happened over the last um, six to 12 months. Essentially where we are today with regards to vaccine and therapeutics and the approach to COVID-19 really is a tribute. We can attribute a lot of that to the work of what was done with many public and private partnerships. Um, with the CDC, the FDA, with Operation Warp Speed, working with the active groups, et cetera, we would not be in the position where we are right now to approach this virus with, again, our therapeutics with monoclonal antibodies and with the vaccines that we have seen come to market in such amazing um, speed. Now, because they've come at an amazing speed does not mean that corners were cut or that these are not safe. Um, the two currently available vaccines that we have um, available to patients are mRNA vaccines. These are new platforms of vaccines. We have never had vaccines for individuals using this tip with this type of platform. What mRNA is, it's genetic, it's genetic material that essentially gives a message to the body um, to encode for that spike protein. So the vaccine essentially has lab generated mRNA, which in, will subsequently encode for the spike protein. It is then put into lipid bilayers and then salts and sugars and buffers to essentially protect it from degradation. And the, that's the vaccine product that is given to people. The mRNA in this vaccine does not incorporate into people's cells. It does not change your genetic makeup. It does not change your cells, which has been 
a concern or a comment that people have wondered because it is a genetic material, will it change my underlying genetic material? The answer is no. That mRNA, once it gets into a cell, can then be read by different mechanisms in your cell to make that spike protein. And then what your body does is it recognizes, hey, this is foreign. And that's the way that we then stimulate our immune system to make an antibody or what we call a cell-mediated immune response to that particular new, that new antigen or the spike protein. What we know thus far is that with the mutations that we've seen with the newer um, variants of COVID-19 is that we are not seeing changes specifically in the spike protein that our vaccine won't cover those. But again, as Dr. Weston pointed out, because these are um, developed in the research lab or um, the mRNA is developed there, it would be very easy to modify vaccines to cover subsequent strains if we do find that there is a inability of this vaccine to cover newer strains that develop. The current thing we know about efficacy of this vaccine is they talk about a vaccine efficacy of, about, of around 94%. What exactly does that mean? Well, vaccine efficacy is essentially a number which is generated from a very, they're generated in clinical trials where there are controlled settings, where you have people who got the vaccine and those who didn't get the vaccine. And if you look at those, a vaccine efficacy of 94% essentially means that there's a 94% reduction in, the, in people who got the vaccine of getting the disease versus those people who didn't get the vaccine. So what we don't know is because this was in the clinical trial with the people who didn't receive the vaccine, they got a placebo versus the vaccine, is what will happen in real life because we also assume that people who enrolled in the clinical trials were also doing all of the things that we are recommending from a public health standpoint. Wear your mask, social distancing, limiting time with, with groups, et cetera. So time will tell exactly what the exact efficacy will be, but it's, it is expected to be quite high. And we're very anxious to see what um, we will see in the future. Thus far in the United States, there have been about five and a half million Case um, doses that have been distributed. I think in the state of Wisconsin, there's almost um, 90,000 um, 90, doses that have been given. If we look at concerns for reactions to the vaccine, we have there's been a lot in the media about hypersensitivity or anaphylactic reactions to this. Those are very unusual. But what we want people to know is if you have had an allergic reaction in the past, specifically to polyethylene glycol, which is in certain medications like Miralax or things that they give uh, for bowel preps before a colonoscopy, or other polysorbates that you may have an allergic reaction to this vaccine. We would therefore then suggest if you have that type of an allergy to discuss with your primary care doctor or with an allergy immunologist before going forward with getting this vaccine. Allergies to other vaccines, like a flu shot, et cetera, would not translate into specifically an allergy to this specific vaccine. However, we do also recommend if you have a history of many allergies or allergies to other vaccines that you seek the guidance of your primary care physician um, or an allergy immunologist before you go forward with the COVID-19 vaccine. The most common reactions we're seeing with the vaccine are essentially site reactions or local site reactions. The arm can be sore, it can be tender, people can feel fatigued for a short period of time. The anaphylactic episodes that have been reported in the news media, um, most of the time those occur within about 15 to 30 minutes at most after the injection. They are, they can be, anaphylactic reactions can be quite severe, but most of the ones I've read about have been relatively minor and controlled quite easily with either um, diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, or patients, if they do need an, an EpiPen or epinephrine, there was one case reported in the media of a physician with a severe shellfish allergy who developed a reaction after getting the vaccine, but had his own EpiPen, and then he was fine afterwards. 
If anything like that happens, then again, it would be talking to your uh, physician to see if you should get that second, um, sh that second shot. The data right now from CDC or the recommendation from CDC is if you've had an anaphylactic reaction that you should not receive that, a true anaphylactic reaction, do not do that. But if you have just had a local site reaction, go ahead with your second shot. The one last thing I would recommend with regards to uh, making sure that everybody knows about the reactions or the side effects from the vaccine is that when you get the vaccine, you should make sure that you sign up for be safe. So when everybody is getting the vaccine, they should be given a paper which talks about be safe. You can go to cdc.gov slash be safe. Um, which essentially will give you information and it will track and you can send in information about side effects. They will send you text alerts and you can tell them about side effects from the vaccine. Or you can go to the uh, Vaccine Adverse Event uh, Reporting System, vaers.hhs.gov, um, and report any type of an allergic reaction or severe reaction that you feel that you may have had from the vaccine. We feel that this is going to be an incredibly safe vaccine. We feel that this combined with the public health measures we have in place right now, the masking, the social distancing, the care that we are taking, all of those things will lead to a significant reduction in the number of cases that we are seeing. Even though we see these new variants, the hope is, is that this will lead to a significant reduction over the next several months. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Our first question from the media comes from Casey Cronus at Fox 6. For Dr. Weston or Dr. Graham, are there supply constraint concerns in Milwaukee County and Wisconsin when it comes to the distribution of the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccines? Is there any indication that the administration of the second dose of Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine to healthcare workers, first responders, nursing home residents, et cetera, will be delayed locally? And is it still effective to receive a second dose, even if it's delayed? So I, I can start. That to Dr. Weston. <laughs> sure, I'll start off here. So, um, so that would probably be a question for the state. Uh, that is a separate allocation that's sent out uh, after the first allocation. So we have every expectation that the the second doses will be coming uh, about 21 days for uh, Pfizer and and 28 days for the Moderna. Um, there is, and, and here's where Dr. Graham might be able to uh, expand, but there is a, a four-day grace period for each where you can get it a little bit early. Um, there's not as clear a grace period as my understanding after the vaccine for how far after uh, you can receive it. Ideally, you receive it at that 21-day uh, or that 28-day period, uh, but it, is, it does have some effectiveness even if you receive it after that. But certainly, uh, our plans, our hopes, our expectations uh, are that anybody who receives uh, a vaccine on day one will be able to uh, get their second dose on day 21 uh, or day 28, depending on the vaccine. I, I'm gonna echo what Dr. Weston said. Um, my understanding is that for our institution, for Freighter and Medical College, um, people did not get their first vaccine if we don't have assurance that they're gonna be able to get that second vaccine within that period of time. And I think many institutions are making sure um, that they have that. So the facilities that will get Moderna, which is a 28 day versus Pfizer, which is a 21 day, have made provisions ahead of time that they can cover the people who previously got the vaccine. Um, there is that little bit of a lag time, again, that four day before, um, but you're exactly right, Dr. Weston, we don't know um, if something happens in between, um, should that individual, what do you do with that second dose? Most of the time, the recommendation is if somebody gets, right now what we're seeing in the um, reported are people who got their first, first dose of vaccine then were diagnosed with COVID. And then the recommendation from CDC is go ahead with your second dose of the vaccine as scheduled because you'll be out of that, you know, if, if you otherwise, you know, were admitted to the hospital and you did well, et cetera, you'd be out of that isolation period and you can go ahead and get it on the routine um, schedule. The only thing that would delay that um, the CDC is saying if people receive the monoclonal antibody therapy, um, that they do not then get the vaccine for at least 90 days. Our next question comes from Hillary Mintz at WISN 12 for Mayor Barrett. You said it took 10 days to get 100 doses and 800 additional doses, hopefully by Monday. The White House Task Force says Wisconsin needs to be more aggressive to save lives. What specifically are you doing to advocate for the people of Milwaukee? 
Well, I can tell you that we've been on the phone uh, with the governor's office, with the Department of Health and Human Services this week, as well as last week, to make sure that we're expediting this as much as we can. Um, what I did say is that we were approved by the state on December 28th, um, and we got our first allocation yesterday. Um, and what we've done now is, as I've er said earlier in this briefing, that has already begun. So we're actually moving along on two different tracks. One is we wanted to make sure that we were literally putting the shot at the people's arms, and that has begun. And we've, as I also mentioned, we've given over half of the 100 that we received. We will receive the next allocation on Monday of 800. So what we are doing is we are preparing the Wisconsin Center right now um, to, to work with us. We have the freezers were, were delivered yesterday. There is a secure area at the Wisconsin Center um, to make sure that we are dealing with those security problems that we saw in Grafton. Um, but we know that in the first allotment we get next week that it will come to us in staggered amounts. Um, and that's actually a good thing um, because we wanna make sure that we can use that as quickly as possible and so we'll get some on Monday and on the later days of the week. Um, I've talked to the commissioner today and she can weigh on, in on this as well. It is our plan right now in real time to expand this as quickly as we can. Um, so this is all happening in real time. Again, we have the shot here. We are administering the shot and more shots, many more shots um, will be delivered in five days. So it's, it's, it's growing exponentially and it's going to continue to grow exponentially. Commissioner? Thanks, Mayor. So yeah, I would um, just echo your comments around the growth exponentially. Uh, we started uh, today with our first um, actual vaccinations and um, are working really hard to just measure our ability um, to have capacity and realizing um, today that we have a bit more capacity than um, than planned for. So we are excited about that and um, are making adjustments as we see fit to move forward. So um, as you shared next week, we anticipate um, at least 800 doses. And um, as we move forward in the next um, weeks, we expect that number um, at minimum to double uh, as we move forward. Our next question is from Allison Durrett, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for Mayor Barrett. You started to touch on this, but what more can you tell us about the plans to use the Wisconsin Center as a vaccine distribution site, including when you hope it might open? It should be opening next week. Again, as I mentioned, the freezers were the freezer was was delivered yesterday, um, and that's a big part of it. Although that that is being done in conjunction with our other track, if you will, of getting them in a staggered manner, so that we really don't need the freezer on day number one but we know that this is going to grow exponentially, so we will need the freezer. Um, so that, that is work that's done in preparation for a larger allocation. So we are working out the details with the Wisconsin Center, but it should be open next week. I can't give you the exact hour or day, but um, hopefully it'll be opened as quickly as we're able to open it. Another question from Allison Durr for Mayor Barrett or Commissioner Jackson. Do you have any numbers regarding tests that have taken place at the mobile testing locations? Are you able to, buy, to provide any update on how those are working? Um, yeah, I can share with you. Um, so as of last week, uh, which was, we had a really soft rollout for our mobile testing sites. Um, last week, we had um, 300 tests that were completed at that site. It's open a few hours a day. Um, we're looking to actually uh, move into um, a new location starting um, in the next couple of weeks using our safer model um, over to Pulaski High School. So we'll continue to um, to watch and monitor that, but we're it's not expected to do um, as many tests as Northwest side or excuse me Northwest or um, South side. Another question from Allison Durr: Has the Grafton case changed any of the security measures in Milwaukee and or Milwaukee County when it comes to keeping the vaccine safe? Um, so I can share for you that um, we have already had um, our security protocols in place as it relates to vaccines, whether that be our flu vaccine or now our COVID-19 vaccine. So all of those um, protocols and practices and standards of practices have been reviewed with the entire team that will have access to the vaccine. Um, as well as safety protocols have been gone over and reviewed with the Wisconsin Center. So we feel really comfortable right now as it relates to security and safety. We currently just have one additional question in chat, a reminder to our, our media partners, please continue to place any questions you have for our panelists into the chat. 
The next question is from Hillary Mintz at WISN 12. Just to the south of our border in Lake County, Illinois, is doing drive-through vaccinations in the same climate. They also have had online registration since early December. Viewers want to know why Milwaukee is not pursuing drive-through vaccination. So right now we um, feel that we felt that the Wisconsin Center was um, a safer and more um, controlled environment to start off the vaccine. Um, so that's why we decided to use one space where um, there is a good opportunity for um, observation, a very clear observation of staff after, or excuse me, staff and individuals after they get the vaccine. So we felt that overall it was just a safer environment to do that. Um, however, as we have started our vaccinations and seen um, so far that we've had no reactions um, for individuals that have been vaccinated today, we absolutely are looking to um, see what other opportunities we have to vaccinate and um, drive through is one of those. Another question from Hillary Mintz at WISN 12. Mayor Barrett, what do you think of Tommy Thompson's plan to use UW campuses as vaccination sites? Does the city have enough personnel to administer vaccines? Would you consider contacting retired healthcare workers to ask for help? Well, first of all, I, I, I like the idea that the governor, former governor uh, put forth of using the, the campuses. I think the more places we can have for vaccinations, the better. I think what we have to follow, of course, is the protocol, which is you go through 1A and then 1B and, and so forth. So I think having vaccinators is a good thing. So I, I want to see us have as many vaccination sites as possible. But of course, it has to be in conformity with the plan that's been set forth by the state and CDC. So, so I welcome that. Um, we are ramping up our efforts right now. And the commissioner is probably in a better spot to say whether or not she thinks we'll need to add additional retired personnel. Um, but obviously, we're, we're mindful of the fact that as we get more and more allocations or the higher number in allocations, we're going to need more people. So commissioner, do you want to touch on that? Sure. We're in a really good position um, in the sense that we have the Milwaukee firefighters who are also EMTs to help us and to supplement our staffing. So that's been one of the um, key um, decisions that we have made and um, partnered with Milwaukee Fire Department to as we move into the ramping up phase and opening up to 1B um, and larger populations to utilize that staff. So uh, we feel really comfortable as well that we're going to have good staffing. But it's also important to note that we have used the Wisconsin um, healthcare provider volunteer system um, called Weaver, which um, retired and other individual healthcare healthcare providers can you can go there register and be available to help in situations like this and so we've used that site um, since the beginning of the pandemic and we've had some wonderful healthcare providers nurses um, as well as others um, come to help us out so it's been it's been a great resource our next question is from Allison Durr the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Will the Wisconsin Center be used for city staff or eventually will it be used to provide vaccinations to the public? So right now our anticipation is that we would be using the Wisconsin Center for group 1A and 1B. Um, and then uh, we'll have to see where we are, uh, where how long that takes us to get there and, and what the weather looks like and so forth. So, um, so right now we anticipate 1A and 1B. That was the last question in chat, a final call for questions from the media. One more came in. Uh, what more can you tell us about plans to contract with a security firm to do weekend and evening enforcement? Sure, so um, we are um, in uh, beginning conversations with um, firm with a firm to look at our overall night and weekend enforcement as it relates to capacity limits and the moving Milwaukee forward safely 4.3. So once we, excuse me, uh, yeah, 4.3. Uh, and once we uh, get those um, contracts solidified, then uh, we're, we're happy to share uh, what that looks like. And final call for questions from the media. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We'll be back here with another briefing on Tuesday. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.